All right, everyone, thank you for joining us. We're just gonna get started here. I'm gonna pass this off to Council Member Doreen Carlin. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This is the Human Services and Community Safety Meeting. It's important to understand that um, no formal votes or decisions about city programs, policies, or budgets will happen here at this meeting. Our role is to explore various topics with our staff and stakeholders and community members and to make recommendations to our council colleagues. We want this process to be transparent, inclusive, and easy for you to be a part of whenever you choose to be. And you can share your thoughts with us by filling out a comment card um, about any item that is on the meeting or agenda or by reaching out to us directly with other thoughts, questions, or ideas. We need you to fill out a comment card in advance that can be read into the record um, for an agendized item. And the link to the comment cards can be found on our committee webpage at www.tempe.gov forward slash HSCS. And you will also find the comment cards in the back of the room. Um, and you will be able to find contact information for the committee members and staff um, on that webpage also. So again, thank you so much for being here. With that said, um, I would like to call the meeting to order on January 27th, 2023, uh, meeting for the Human Services and Community Safety Council Committee. Um, with that said, reviewing the minutes, uh, I move to approve December 7th, 2022 meeting minutes. Doreen. I second that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there you go. It's approved. <laughs> that was easy. Uh, let's see. Um, so we are going to first go through the public comment cards. So we are going to be on agenda item number three. Um, the committee welcomes public comment and according to the Arizona Open Meetings Law, the committee may only discuss matters listed on the agenda. Matters brought up by the public under public appearances that are not listed on the agenda cannot be discussed by the committee. A three minute um, limit per person will be in effect. And um, Paul, do you have our comment cards? Thank you, Council Member Garland. Yes, I do. Um, I'm going to be calling up um, uh, individuals who have fil filled out comment cards first in chambers, uh, starting with Ted Karcher. Hello, Council Members. Thanks for having me here today. My name is Ted Karcher, owner of HQ Vape and Smoke right down the street, University of Nash. And first off, after getting a copy of the ordinance, you know, the slideshow for today, I'd like to say that uh, a lot of the things in here we're on board with, right? Because this important subject, no one wants uh, minors to get tobacco products. So raising the age and establishing it at 21, we're all on board with, we all agree on that, and a lot of businesses are currently doing that. So I think that's a good sign. We're all in agreement on that. Um, the next one, establishing a tobacco seller's license, an important tool to hold shops accountable for those people that um, aren't upholding their end of the bargain and enforcing it, and we're in agreement with that. And I also like to see that it seems that you guys have heard and our concerns about the flavor ban, which I think a lot of people were very emotional about, people on both sides of the issue. And I think uh, leaving it out for now is wise because you can see the issues it's caused in places that have already you know, put a ban in place, You know, a lot of the problems that have arisen from that historically and currently. So I would just like to say, you know, in the future as it has been considered, and you guys are gonna talk about it, that we're all involved, and I appreciate the involvement, the engagement, so that we can all continue to be on the same page, look at, you know, facts, you know, impact and stuff like that. You know, and I appreciate the time and uh, looking forward to hearing you because we like to be involved in the stakeholder process because these laws do affect us. And uh, <clears throat> we're happy to be a part of the process and. We want to keep these products out of the hands of minors as well. You know, these are adult products. So thank you again for your time. We look forward to uh, working with you on this on the future. Thank you, Mr. Kirchner. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker will be Chanel Powell.
um, Chairperson Garland and Navarro. My name is Chanel Poe. I am with Flavors Hooks Kids Tempe. I am a advocate and a LD8 resident. Thank you very much for hosting this uh, community session to have stakeholder input in regards to uh, the ordinance. While I do believe that licensing is extremely important, I think it's very critical that we take into fact that I have seen firsthand how Flavors hooks children. As a former elected school board member, one of the last board resolutions that we were able to adopt is an anti-tobacco resolution. As I step onto your property in the city of Tempe and I see a lot of signs that says there is no smoking on these properties and within these governmental entities as well, as well as when I look across the street at ASU and all of its surrounding campuses who have also taken into consideration to banning tobacco, uh, flavored tobacco. Uh, the impetus is an equity imperative. As a member of the African American community, we know, the FDA knows, and put a notice out to consider placing a ban on these menthol products that have hooked not only members of my family, but members of my community. 85% of African American smokers smoke menthol cigarettes. We have been long targeted since the 80s and 90s of entertainers that I truly appreciate, uh, but they utilize that as a stepping stone to be able to break into the industry for sponsorship. While we have the power to exercise our local control, this is, a, um, again, a health equity impetus for us to look at what we can do to prevent our children from getting a hold to these tobacco products. And they're, they're doing it in school. They're bringing it to campuses. We really want to focus on putting children first over profit to really understand that we are focusing on what the future looks like in every city and municipality that I go to for effective governance trainings and facilitations that I also host, everywhere I look, I see young children putting these things to their mouth. And they said, children did state themselves that the number one reason that they did get into smoking is because of the flavors. I do appreciate once again for you to take a full scope and garner all the information of the models, the multiple models that we have across our country and multiple municipalities that truly speak to why we have this grave opportunity in front of us to blend the flavors that hooks kids. Look, I was going to buy cigarettes at 10 years old for my granddad who was on those Newports because it masked the smell. Even, and guess what? He ended up dying of a tobacco-related disease. And over 40,000 African Americans per year die of the disease. We know that big tobacco puts a lot of money into these campaign and targeting our youth. And we know that flavors and menthol are the primary reasons that they do so. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Poe. Our next speaker is Joe Yuhas. <coughs> Well, good afternoon, council members and city staff. Thank you and appreciate coming before you representing the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and the Tempe Flavors Coalition. Um, clearly, the um, action before you today demonstrates that you recognize that there's a serious problem with underage smoking that needs to be addressed in Tempe. You know, it reflects the same concerns that were shared before you almost a year and a half ago now by the Tempe Flavors Coalition, a coalition that I remind you includes over 50 public health, education, youth advocacy, social justice, and faith-based organizations, including the Tempe Union High School District, Tempe Elementary School District, and now more recently, the City of Tempe African American Advisory Committee. Now the coalition has provided you with data and science, the appalling rate of sales to underage kids, the proliferation of retailers, including a full 25% of them that are within the required distance limit of schools established by city ordinance. And of course, the actions of the tobacco cartel that has made it plainly clear for decades that they will spare no expense or action, including some of the testimony that's been provided to you over the past several months uh, to protect um, their ability to recruit underage population to their customer base. Look, I get it. The industry's focused on protecting its commercial interests. But the point will come very soon when the ultimate question is asked of Tempe leaders. Whose side are you on? Are you on the side of kids 
or on the side of big tobacco. Now the creation of a retail licensing program is a small step, but in itself, this will not address the, ac the epidemic of youth tobacco use. Licensing alone fails to address the critical and detrimental impact flavored tobacco products are having on well, increasing tobacco addiction among communities' youth. Further delays in aggressively tackling this grave public health concern will not only lead to greater cost in dollars, but more importantly, lives. We need to deal with this issue comprehensively, and we simply can't afford to do it piecemeal. Unless it's combined with an end to the sale of flavored tobacco products in the city, Tempe's current plan to move forward with a licensing uh, program will make for a great political talking points, but will have little hope of reducing underage smoking rates within the city. So indeed, let's get this initial step in place. Then let's move forward with the next steps before more Tempe kids get hooked. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uhas. Next speaker is Juan Sayeg. Hello, my name is Juan Sage, and I've been a business owner here in Phoenix, uh, Tempe for about 15 years. And I'd just like to add a couple notes of some articles that were written by in uh, the uh, <clears throat> New York Times, or I'm sorry, um, in the Yale News, for one. Um, there's been some studies done from the San Francisco ban in uh, 2001 that were done on you know eliminating flavors in San Francisco and it's found that Yale School of Public Health that the analysis found by their studies that it's actually caused a negative effect in drawing more children to smoking and these are articles that you can look up yourself and also published by the JAMA uh, pediatrics uh, study that these uh, bans affect uh, the my, uh, people uh, younger smoking in a negative effect, drawing them to cigarettes more than anything. So there is a little bit of uh, history out there with these bands, and it seems to be that there's some studies coming out now from 2018, 19, and so forth that show that the ban does not work. In fact, draws people more into smoking or people that should not be smoking more into uh, the negative effects of cigarettes which is a concoction of hundreds of chemicals and make uh, things way more addictive. I, for one, have been a smoker for over 20 years. I, um, thanks, thank you to, thanks to vaping, I am now not hacking in the mornings. I feel a lot better. And I know that it worked for me and other people that I know. So um, I think that it would be a negative to make a ban on this. And also, Quite honestly, banning, uh, as far as they were, from what I've heard, they were even considering doing flavors on shisha, which is traditionally over 500 years old and affects many cultures as being a very negative take on, on uh, being open-minded with other cultures in this town. And as we know, most people that come to Tempe here are students from all over the world. I don't think that's a good representation of our state and what, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tempe is all about. I think we're open to all kinds of cultures and ideas, and I'd like to, you to please consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sage. The next speaker is Matthew Bannon. Good morning, committee members. My name is Matthew Bannon. I'm a Scottsdale resident. I've made my livelihood in Tempe continuously for over 23 years. Uh, and I am a tobacco vendor as of now unlicensed. Uh, I'd like to read a brief excerpt from this letter from the Office of the Arizona Attorney General that we received uh, on December 22nd. Dear Tobacco Retailer, on December 29th, or on December 9th, our agent of our office inspected your business. A minor under the agent's supervision attempted to purchase a tobacco product and your employee properly refused to sell the tobacco product. This kind of data is recorded and registered and put into charts and graphs, which you may see by, presented by some coalitions. Data that is not recorded and not put into graphs that coalitions may present to you 
is data like this. These are counterfeit IDs, and every single one of them represents us refusing, and rightfully so, sale of a prohibited product to a minor. And even if that data could be compiled, there is not enough colored ink in any print shop to represent how preponderously we're doing our job without oversight. We're doing the right thing. Um, I think this legislation or a form of it will pass. I think ultimately the $300 annual renewable license will go through. I think it's a great idea. That means maybe 15 cents on top of every pack of cigarettes that we've been throughout the year pays for that. I don't have a problem with it. I think it'll get rid of a lot of the nefarious riffraff that are presently making tobacco accessibility uh, effortless for our youth. Um, but I think this legislation or elements of it that are being considered is sort of like a cupcake. You know, the licensing and the raising the age is the cupcake. The five inches of frosting that people scoop out in the trash is this pearl-clutching concern for flavors hooking our youth. My, I have an adolescent son, and since he was a small child, he knows that the cucumber lime shampoo is not something that is good to eat. The, the flavor sounds delicious, but he knows it's not good for you, so he doesn't do it. We know we've taught him that the vapes and the tobacco isn't good for him, so he doesn't do it. And I think that this concern by these such coalitions for our youth, uh, I find it more meddlesome and, frankly, a little condescending than comforting. Um, I think if we take legislation and use it as a substitute for inefficacious parenting, it is fraught with the potential for abuse. Um, other than that, I think my primary concern, being a liquor retailer in Tempe for 23 years, is that the argument is paper thin against a product that is already prohibited to minors. Uh, if the flavors are hooking kids with the tobacco, the argument stands they'll be hooking the kids with the alcohol. And who gets to draw the lines between a sugary blue raspberry buzz ball versus a venerated brand like Grand Marnier, which has been on the shelf since before Arizona became a state? Again, legislation which could be fraught with the potential for abuse. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, just a, a warning. The, no, we don't do clapping in, in City Hall, please. Our next speaker is Bill Anir. Hi, council members. Thank you. My name is Bill Anir, and I'm with Triton Smoke Shops. I also have one of those letters from December 13th from our state. I also have one from my uh, one in Mesa from the FDA saying that I was in compliance, like always. And my question is, yes, I think the licensing is great. I think it's a great thing for us to have some more accountability for these um, instances in small areas. But I think our accountability needs to be held back onto the children because they're the ones breaking the law and they're the ones that need to have underage consumption laws equal to alcohol. You put that on the books and have something that goes along with that. These schools will have something to say, here's a ticket, and you get to go with your parents to court now for a $50 fine or more. That's something sustainable that the parents have to deal with, and they are held accountable to deal with their child. When you have a stove and you're teaching your child not to touch the stove, I don't see you throwing your stove out of your house. On the contrary, you teach your, contra you teach your children that there is consequences for touching that, and they abide by that. Therefore, that's the same thing that we have going on right here, especially when there's a lot of good, honest business owners that are doing our job. That's all I really have to say today. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anir. The next speaker is Nicole Olmsted. That one works, right? I have to go with the short one. <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. I'm Nicole Olmsted, and I am a Tempe resident. My kids go to school in Tempe, and I'm with the American Heart Association, which is also located in Tempe. We have been working for more than a year with the Tempe City Council on a joint effort to establish a tobacco retail license and address the sale of all flavored tobacco products within Tempe. While it's a step forward towards tobacco regulation to establish the tobacco retail license, and it's great to see that it is possibly going to be modeled after other cities in Arizona that have done the same thing, it's very concerning that these efforts are being split. The you've heard a little bit about parents needing to take responsibility for their own kids. 
I am one of those parents that had a kid who was addicted to a tobacco product at the age of 16. She knew where to get the products. She knew which retailers were going to sell to her. I work for the American Heart Association. I preach to my children not to smoke tobacco. And there were consequences for smoking tobacco products. It is not always just about parents taking responsibility. We do the best that we can, and we make sure that there are consequences. But when these products are effectively marketed to our children, there is only so much that we can do. And that is where we need help. The tobacco retail license is absolutely necessary in order to ensure that retailers are following all of the applicable laws and regulations around selling tobacco. In previous meetings and work groups and hearings, we have demonstrated that there are numerous retailers in Tempe that are not following the law, that repeatedly sell to those underage despite being caught doing so. And it's commendable that they have folks that are following the regulations. That is fantastic. That is what we want to see. But the data shows that overall, over the past five years, 53% of the tobacco retailers in Tempe that we know of have sold repeatedly to kids. I know that, we, that this is something that's being split into two and that we hope that we're going to be able to move forward with and that you remain committed to the, um, addressing the sale of flavored tobacco. I hope this happens. The American Heart Association, American Lung Association, American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network, and others in our coalition urge you to move forward to address the sale of flavored tobacco with expediency. The longer we draw this process out, the more Tempe youth are enticed by and subsequently addicted to the fun flavored tobacco products the industry markets to them. Tempe can and should be a leader in this work. As we have offered before and will con continue to do so, we are here to meet with staff and others to be a resource on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Olmstead. Thank you. We're going to move on to our uh, comment cards submitted for those of us who are joining uh, virtually. I will be unmuting those folks, uh, starting with Amanda Gray. Amanda, you can begin your comment now. Thank you. Uh Council members and staff. For the record, my name is Amanda Gray. I'm the executive director of the Arizona Petroleum Marketers Association. We represent convenience stores, gas stations, and fuel distributors all across the state and in the city of Tempe. Um, I wanted to thank members of the council and the mayor and staff for their ongoing dialogue with the regulated community as this ordinance advances. As you can consider next steps, I wanted to advocate briefly for a partnership on a statewide solution to tobacco and vapor regulation. Um, the handout for today discusses uh, licensing done enacted by the city of Tucson and the city of Flagstaff. Um, in Tucson, they're, they are collecting a tobacco retailer license fee, but I would ask with what level of enforcement and in the city of Flagstaff, while they passed an ordinance, they have never implemented an actual licensing program. So while Flagstaff retailers are required to get a license, there's no way to do that. So I would ask, how does that serve the common goal of reduced youth access? We think that statewide licensure would be the best case scenario for effective and consistent enforcement. Um, retailers are supportive of enacting T21 and licensing at the state level but we haven't been able to get that to the finish line and we'd like the opportunity to work together on solutions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Next on my list is Akil uh, Alati. Alati. Uh, Akil, I don't see you on my list. Uh, can you make yourself known in the chat? We're going to move on and come back if necessary. Um, our next speaker will be Brianna Miller. Brianna, you are unmuted. Please be your comment now. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Brianna Miller. I'm a health policy specialist at Children's Action Alliance, and we're located in Phoenix, but do um, work across the state. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly speak today and for continuing to work to protect Tempe's children and youth. Children's Action Alliance works directly with communities statewide that are the most impacted by pervasive health inequities. So our goal is to realize an Arizona where all children can thrive. So as an organization concerned with the health and well-being of children in Arizona, CAA does support the proposal for establishing a tobacco retailer and seller's license that's before you today. We are, however, concerned that a tobacco license without an accompanying comprehensive flavored tobacco ban does not go far enough in keeping harmful products out of the hands of Tempe's youth. 
A retail license isn't a solution, it's a tool, and won't alone go far enough to keep Tempe's kids from a lifetime of nicotine addiction. We do look forward to continued dialogue on enacting a comprehensive ban on all flavored tobacco products in Tempe for the reasons that you've heard um, from previous speakers today. Tempe has been and continues to be a leader on this issue, so let's not let this become a missed opportunity to prioritize the health and well-being of Tempe's kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Our next speaker is Job Dickinson. Job, I do not see you on my list, so if you were on the call, please make yourself known on the chat. Moving on to our next speaker, Justin Harris. Justin, I also don't see you on my list. So if you can make yourself known on the chat, we'll come back to you. Our next speaker is Mark Miller, who indicated that he'd be attending virtually. I do not see him on my list. Uh, Mark, if you can make yourself known and we'll come back to you. Our next speaker is Trisha Hart. Trisha, we are unmuting you. Please may begin your comment now. Thank you, Paul. For the record, my name is Trish Hart and I represent the Arizona Food Marketing Alliance which represents retail grocery stores and convenience stores throughout the state and in, in the city of Tempe. I just wanted to echo the comments of appreciation to the council members that have been uh, made today. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to have a seat at the table in this very important issue. And as responsible retailers of these products, we look forward to continuing those dialogues and those conversations as this moves through, through the process and just wanted to um, we appreciate the the openness and the willingness to have these conversations and we look forward to um, working with everyone at at the table as it moves forward so thank you very much thank you Ms. Hart moving on to the folks who uh, submitted comment cards to be read into the record uh, starting with Akash Tathi as a business owner in Tempe for many years, I find this potential menthol ban to be bad for business in the community. It will not encourage good behaviors, only that Tempe businesses lose customers to neighboring cities. This measure would negatively impact my business and employees. City leaders should focus on more important things during these economically challenging times. Akash, T and B Shell, Tempe. Our next comment card submitted is from Gurpreet Santu. I've been a responsible business owner of multiple stores for many years and tobacco flavor bans like this do not work. This will only encourage bad behaviors and customers will go to other nearby cities hurting Tempe businesses. Youth smoking is already at an all time low and this will create a black market and further increase problems. The federal government already has 21 in place City of Tempe should not go through with this ban. The next comment card submitted is from Mel Aouf. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, I, Mohammed Aouf, take part as an accountable retailer of tobacco and vapor products in the city of Tempe. Reading the pr proposed flavor ban of some of the products sold at my store leaves me greatly worried for many reasons, one of which is that this ban will negatively impact my business due to reduced sales, possible layoffs, and likely to reduce the number of store hours throughout the work week. Please note that this ban will likely encourage individuals to break the law. Bans are clearly not an effective strategy in protecting the people, hence evidence shows that they will turn to other substances such as alcohol and op opioids. Furthermore, the, the reduction of sales, the increase in layoffs, and business closures that can, can adversely affect the city on a large spectrum. This would be due to, to the less tax dollars paid by my counterparts and myself if the ban is passed. As a responsible retailer, I am committed to working with the city of Tempe to prevent tobacco sales to underage individuals. It is of my best interest to be updated on all stakeholder meetings regarding this issue. This is a very important issue which requires a deep examination with all council members and staff. I hope you consider all factors before making a decision on such a matter. I appreciate your time in reading this letter and hope that there will be no flavor ban. Our next comment card submitted is from Sam Bott. 
I own multiple stores in Phoenix and Tempe, and I have invested in Clover POS system to scan IDs and age verify for only sales to 21-year-old adults to purchase tobacco products. This proposed ban only serves to limit the product choices of adult customers. And if adult customers cannot buy their preferred products in our stores, they will just go outside the city to make their purchases. While there, they will also purchase gas, grocery items, and beverages. Worse yet, prohibiting these products could shift sales from law-abiding responsible retailers like us to potentially illegal sources who don't check IDs. This will hurt my business and businesses like mine in Tempe and could result in lost jobs for employees. Please do not move forward with this tobacco flavor ban. Our next comment card is from Jay Sidhu. This proposed city ban only serves to limit the product choices of adult customers. If adult customers cannot buy their preferred products in our stores, they will just go outside of the city to buy them. While they will also buy food, gas, and other items, our family has owned this business for many years, and this will hurt our customers, employees, and our business. Youth smoking is the lowest in a generation, and the city of Tempe should not move forward with this ban. Thank you, Jade Sidhu, Pride Food Mart. Our next comment card submitted is from Carl O'Kelly. Local jurisdictions must be alert for and vigorously act against new settings that lure youth socially and include starting nicotine addiction. The setting for flavored e-cigarettes, for example, was school bathrooms. Now ruthless tobacco peddlers operating hookah lounges, shisha cafes, and either even Middle Eastern nightclubs and Parisian re Persian restaurants are persuading local authorities to give them exemptions from tobacco 21, T21 laws and or laws against indoor smoking. And worst of all, are brazenly ignoring those laws when they don't get their ways. The smoke from burning flavored shisha tobacco charcoal is the most dangerous tobacco smoke of all, with 10 times more carbon monoxide and 25 times more tar. Therefore, it is least, the least justifiable exemption to a ban on selling flavored tobacco products. The FDA is alert to the new to be to flavored tobacco products that tobacco oligarchs are using to addict a new generation of youth to nicotine. This week, this, this week the FDA issued marketing denial orders, MDOs, for two views menthol e-cigarette products currently marketed by R.J. Reynolds Vapor Company, subsidiary of British American Tobacco, rejecting their pre-market tobacco product applications for menthol e-liquid le refills used in views. Vibe Tank Menthol 3.0% and the Vu's Zero uh, Cartridge Menthol 1.5%. Shisha Tobacco Charcoal, charcoal Smoke and Hookah Water Pipes comes in flavors that mirror e-liquid flavors of e-cigarettes, apple, mint, cherry, chocolate, coconut, licorice, cappuccino, and watermelon. Flavored Shisha Tobacco Charcoal Smoke and Hookah Water Pipes must be included in all laws pertaining to flavored tobacco products. The scare tacti tactic of shisha tobacco charcoal peddlers claiming that there will be lost tourism, convention, and or, or other business if shales, sales of flavored tobacco products is banned has already been dispro disproven in real venues. The Gaming Control Board reports that smoke-free Baton Rouge casinos posted a 10% revenue gain in the holiday season December 2022 from, tw from November 2022. Please enact the strongest and broadest ordinance that will end the sale of all flavored tobacco and electronic cigarette products with no exceptions. The tobacco industry uses products like cotton candy e-cigarettes, grape cigars, and minty menthol cigarettes to lure kids, plain and simple. Flavored tobacco products are fueling the youth nicotine addiction crisis, and it's time for Tempe to act, as hundreds of communities across the country have done. Please require that all tobacco retailers obtain a license. Arizona is one of only a few states that doesn't require this, so Tempe must act. Licensing allows officials to determine which stores are selling tobacco products. This helps ensure that they are complying with the law and that they aren't selling to kids. Licensing also helps stop repeat offenders by allowing the city to suspend or revoke their privilege to sell. Council member, those are the last of the submitted uh, council uh, committee uh, speaking cards. I'm looking through the chat and I do not see any of those who are called recognizing themselves. So I think we are good to move on. All right, we will go ahead and close uh, that part of our 
um, agenda. I just want to say thank you so much again to everybody who um, came to speak um, for us. We really appreciate that. So the next item on the agenda um, is we're going to go to our committee session items. And our first one is we're going to have an update on the Park Ranger and Lake Ranger program. We're going to have that with Craig Hayden. Thank you, Council Members Garland and Navarro, Craig Hayden, Community Services Director. I'm here taking the lead on the conversation today and providing the update, but we have, um, as we do so much within the city, uh, multiple departments working on this effort together. So I get a chance today to be the, uh, the one communicating where we're at. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I will likely default to using the term park ranger, but it's meant to be park and the lake ranger program. So forgive me for leaving the lake piece off. It's certainly an important part of the program that we're looking at. And I'll also likely refer to parks, but it's meant to really look at our parks and recreational system, including the preserves as well. So if it is meant to be as comprehensive as possible. So today would love to cover um, really the performance measure that we're focused on, which is 1.23 and how we believe a Park Lake Ranger program actually um, provides a positive impact. Um, we'll run through the goal, mission, benefits, and advantages of having a city-run Park and Lake Ranger program, um, the overview of the program, as well as some job functions, kind of getting in a little bit of the weeds, um, and then focus on some coverage considerations as we talk about the potential for scalability. So to frame the performance measure, I know it's part of the work plan for the committee, 1.23, the feeling of safety in parks, very subjective, but it is certainly something that we believe is impacted by um, folks feeling safe based on the activities happening in a park, whether it's an activated park, folks utilizing a park in the right way, or potentially some prohibited activities aren't being addressed. Um, but it also can be a, a different conversation than we're having today, which is the maintenance and the improvements within a park and how that supports the feeling of safety. So it's based on community survey results. Um, the target is 88% day and night in three different park categories with neighborhood parks, city parks like the Town Lake and Kiwanis, as well as our desert parks and preserves. As you can see, the, the data is the lowest on the score is the desert preserves at night at 36%. And the highest so far is our regional parks at 81% or city parks during the day. Um, some recent numbers that we're looking at just from the recent survey. Um, we have seen a downward trend in the feeling of safety within parks, um, specifically um, at night um, of 6%, so that is certainly concerning. Um, but we also see in that second bullet point that there, our city parks are utilized pretty heavily by our community at 79%. Um, and then there is a big difference on the perceived level of safety, feeling of safety between daytime and nighttime. If we look at the nighttime bullet, for example, 32% are dissatisfied with another 31% as neutral, so together that's 63% um, are not satisfied or haven't identified satisfied as how they feel. So an, an important opportunity then um, is ahead of us. Uh, we believe the reinstitution re of the park ranger program, something managed by the city, um, as we had before the downturn back in the late 2000s, would make a positive impact. Um, really meant to address security and the ability to address negative behaviors within all 52 of our parks. It's meant to be comprehensive, also including the preserves that we've talked about. Um, it directly and positively impacts the performance measure. Um, it really improves community ties. Um, it, it even provides additional oversight within our park maintenance activities and be able to provide some security for, for our team. Um, and then ultimately, it, it, it is meant to not just address negative behaviors, but be an ambassador in allowing folks to know through an educational lens what is prohibited and what is not uh, within a parks. And ultimately, we're in the experience business where we want to provide valuable recreational experiences. That is to folks like vendors and businesses who are actually there to do that, but as, all, as well as the folks who are within our park system, whether it's our Tempe community members themselves or visitors that come to Tempe. So we believe um, on the benefit side, there is a significant um, positive opportunity for us. And similarly, the advantages of utilizing something that is in-house within the city, um, potentially migrating away from our currently contracted park security, uh, we know that the enhanced um, coordination, the ability to be more flexible and where we assign staff um, is a huge up um, opportunity for us, as well as the control, direct control over the hiring, um, onboarding, and training of staff. Um, our ability to directly supervise and manage employees um, provides an opportunity to reduce liability. Um, and ultimately, the interdepartmental cooperation just would be um, emphasized even more than it currently happens through an additional lens um, to what is happening through police 
and CARE 7 currently within our areas, but also through some of the other folks that we have. Flexibility would be increased as we'd have direct support and an opportunity to address um, um, the record management system as well as uh, violations within parks. And ultimately, we see an opportunity for increased communication efficiencies and effectiveness. And ultimately, as city employees, we see this as being able then to provide um, a deeper level of culture and contribution to the city as full-time employees rather than as contracted team members. Um, an overview of the program as we're currently looking at it, um, we have done some research just even in the Valley, um, about 50% are managed through local parks and recreation teams. The park and lake safety, obviously the lake piece is kind of a new piece within local jurisdictions, but community services and parks and recreation along with the PD are two typical lead um, organizations within um, the cities that manage the areas. Um, our current approach is that community services will take the lead, but supported through other departments. I've listed a few here, but certainly there's gonna be many more, many more that will be in support of this effort. Um, we look at a robust park and lake ranger program. It would be um, a position that provides additional capacity and flexibility by having it joined together. Um, so if you have potentially two folks that should be working out on the lake, one person calls in, you can pull from a different team to add in rather than just grounding somebody for the day. So we see that as a key component, but we also need that there needs to be some um, direction given on site by some leads, a supervisor responsible for the entire program, and then obviously some administrative support. Uh, we see this as an unarmed professional program with the tools and supplies necessary to handle um, the duties. Um, and also with a focus on watercraft operations, swimming and first aid being a key component, which is a little bit different than what we've seen even locally. And as I mentioned previously, um, it is meant to be comprehensive, but also focused on a tiered approach. We'll utilize data as we currently do to focus on some areas that we wanna target specifically. Um, and that's where our focus would be. Um, getting into the weeds a little bit here, we wanna make sure that the ranger portion of this team uh, would certainly uh, uphold the city's state of mission and values, but also um, really unique is there's an enforcement opportunity. City of Mesa has recently given their rangers an opportunity to enforce park codes. This would be something we would look at specifically to address those negative behaviors, to limit the ability and need for the police department specifically to come in with armed officers, um, provide security, as I mentioned previously, to folks who are within and are just as a positive presence within our parks and preserves, that again, reinforcing the proactive patrol of the Tempe Town Lake. Um, but then there are going to be some opportunities for us to have a handoff to the police department when there are some items that the park and lake rangers are not able to address. And ultimately, um, as each Tempe employee, we want to just make sure that this program provides a really positive ambassadorship for the city, um, really leading with outreach and education as well. So we, we certainly want to provide enforcement opportunities, but we do want to lead with outreach and education when we have those opportunities. And then just to round out some desired skills and training, um, as mentioned previously, would focus on some boat operator watercraft, um, as well as CPR first aid, lifeguard, training and certifications, as well as rescue strong swimmer, just to round out what would normally be included within a park ranger program. Coverage considerations, the way that we're approaching this as we enter into a budget supplemental process, um, scalability is really going to be the key to the conversation. Um, but initially we've looked at um, full seven day a week coverage, 20 hours a day is an hour before and an hour after the majority, if not all of our parks are actually open. So that gives us the ability to be out um, within our park system um, for the en entire time throughout the week that the parks would be open. Uh, we would use historical data to proactively patrol areas. Uh, we would have a proactive patrol presence on the Tempe Town Lake with watercraft, uh, but we also know there's gonna be a reactive um, portion to it as well um, in responding to calls. But also we think there's an opportunity to offset what we currently have as contracted security as we bring our park rangers online. So it's really that foot on the gas and the clutch and just releasing one and focusing on the other. So. Before closing and taking some questions, just wanna um, let the committee know that our next steps is to refine the plan interdepartmentally so that we can provide a scalable budgetary supplemental request, something that mayor and council then um, can certainly um, discuss in total. But we also want to look for creative ways to potentially fund, um, knowing that the Rio Salado has a community facilities district, are there some funding opportunities directly related to the lake piece that we can align lake coverage through um, the CFD specifically is an opportunity. So not just looking at the general fund, but also looking at the CFD to potentially offset some costs. 
So with that, myself and the team would be happy to take any questions. Craig, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Outstanding job, and I appreciate the work and dedication that uh, both Petey and Fire have put into it in your shop also, obviously, in, in making this uh, uh, thing hopefully come to fruition. I know that the council for a number of years has um, ob obviously had concerns with our parks <coughs> and making sure that our, the activities in and around the park are, are you know, um, adequate and, and, and also within our laws. And I, I think we also owe to our residents that in and around the lake area, especially, um, that we provide them with a place that they can enjoy um, for years to come. And I think the park rangers is definitely that step. The added piece, which I'm, I'm really happy about, is our lake piece, um, park lake rangers, so to speak. You know, having the ability to be able to patrol that area, but be able to react in that area via boat, via jet ski, whatever it may be. And then having the ability to have certified uh, trained swimmers, however, that coordination of that program, uh, Coast Guard train, uh, whatever it may be. I know that this lake is, we all know from uh, very many discussions, this is the second most viewed lake behind the Grand Canyon uh, and it, in terms of tourism and attraction. So with our development, with our activity, I think this is a appropriate spot on um, mark that we need to be at. Uh, we're just getting bigger from here. The lake is going to get busier. Uh, we are uh, definitely doing soon water cabs and restaurants in and around the lake. Uh, the activity will increase. And uh, I think this is just a very proactive step in the right direction um, for us to uh, uh, push forward to the council. Um, I appreciate you guys going back, fine tuning um, the costs and also looking at the uh, lake impact fees. Uh, to make sure that we have some other sources to pay for this location of where uh, this uh, uh, office or these these stations may be w around the lake. I know we had an opportunity looking at the uh, hopefully one day the uh, um, uh, boat center uh, on the north side of the lake, um, but also utilizing any other development that we have um, that can also be used uh, office space on on a, on a development below uh, any high rise that might be going on in and around the lake. I think those are another act, uh, opportunities that we need to look at, even if it's um, an opportunity to help dedicate or, or throw funds towards something else, if it's not that facility. And that's something that I think us as a council can utilize as we are giving our land away to other developers. So I think there's some benefits that we can de utilize um, to make the same come to fruition. Um, but I just want to say you're spot on. I appreciate you guys and everybody's teamwork on this. I think this has been collective effort, and you guys have actually done a great job in terms of making it happen so quickly. Um, so uh, definitely this is going to be exciting to bring to the council. Thank you. And I have a really long <coughs> list. I have a long list of words and things I put down from when you were speaking. And I also want to say thank you to everybody who was working on this to put this together. I know that the, the Lake Patrol has been uh, a, a you know, concern for all of us, but I know that Councilmember Navarro has been talking to me about it since I got on council three years ago. Um, you know, I like what you said about the proactive um, response, and I like how you kept calling them ambassadors. I think that's really important for what we're doing moving forward, unarmed ambassadors. So where you have, I look at this kind of like the, the gentleman that worked with the DTA in downtown. There's always somebody walking around with the, I don't know what number of color, yellow green vest, and you know who they are. You have a question, you need help, they're there. They're, you know, talking to people on the street. They're, I, I just like that feeling, and it seems that this is similar to that. Um, I like that this is that we're looking at this as being full-time employees and not contracted. Um, I'm really excited about this not being managed by the PD and being managed by the departments that actually are overseeing the areas that they're going to be in. I think that's really important for us. Um, the watercraft operation, the swimming, the first aid, I think that's really smart. I, we are going to lead the way on, on what we can do in a community um, that has water areas. Um, and then, you know, I, I like the ability that if there are other things, giving the, um, the park rangers the ability to write citations and some smaller level things as you had mentioned, I think that's really smart. I think that then being able to, if there's something bigger calling in the PD if we need them, really great ideas. I'm so excited about this package and I'm gonna ask what can I do, what can we do to help you move this forward and when do you think you guys will be presenting and talking to the rest of the council about it? Because I'm gonna start bragging as soon as I get out of this meeting. <laughs> yeah, I think that's we a great are gonna question. Start so we've got our internal deadlines for the supplemental process that we'll work with Mark in the budget office. Um, we can certainly circle back up with the city manager and, and see 
if this should come back through a work study session or how this would come through potentially through the committee as well. Mm -hmm. So we can look through those options. Um, any feedback that you have even moving forward, we certainly would be happy to take. Um, and then questions throughout the budgetary process. And I'll look to the team as well if there's anything else that suggestions that they have for for moving forward. But we do appreciate the input and the support that you've shown Absolutely. for the plan so far. But certainly we just want to make sure that we're communicating clearly. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. I think you're on the right path. I think we proceed going forward. We try to get this to a work study as soon as possible. If there's any changes, yes, we can reconvene and talk about those changes. But I think you guys have got it down. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, everybody. All right. So um, we're going to move on to our um, agenda item number two. Um, let's see. So um, Paul, Council Aid Paul um, Smith Leonard is going to do our presentation for us. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome, Council Member. I know I'd make it up here at some <laughs> point. Um, I'm here on behalf of Mayor and Council. Uh, to give you an update, um, you and Councilmember Navarro, an update on the proposed ordinance to regulate the sale of tobacco through a tobacco seller license within the city of Tempe. Uh, first up, we have our council priorities that have guided this work from the beginning. Uh, 1.21, youth alcohol, marijuana, and opioid usage rate, and 1.31, addressing opioids. A little bit of background on the uh, proposed ordinance. Uh, this all began uh, when uh, at a work study session, um, uh, thanks to Council Member Navarro and the Tempe Coalition bringing this to the attention of the city of Tempe. Um, we moved forward with the research and uh, considerations of a possible proposed ordinance to establish a tobacco sales license, to, to raise the legal age for tobacco to age 21, and restrict flavored tobacco and vape products. And we had uh, many council committee hearings. Um, we had um, February of 2022, May of 2022, June of 22, and uh, most recently last month uh, in December, uh, the council's human services and community safety committee um, held hearings on the proposed ordinance and agreed to a public engagement plan based on the Tempe involving the public manual, uh, which included uh, two stakeholder meetings and one public forum. So that was in the summer and fall of 2022. Um, like I said before, the public forum and two stakeholder meetings were held uh, in addition to an online poll um, held via Tempe forum, which I believe we extended um, past um, its normal date of, or period of one month to elicit feedback on the proposed ordinance. And today, um, based on that feedback from the public and stakeholders, um, the committee is holding a hearing on changes to the ordinance that would focus on the establishment of a tobacco sellers, seller's license, raising the legal age to 21, and establishing fees to ensure compliance. The Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act allows us to do what we are doing in the city of Tempe signed into law in 2009. Um, it authorizes the FDA to regulate tobacco products. It did preempt some state and local regulations on the books, but it left others, or preserved from pre presumption others, um, including requirements relating to the sale of, to, of the, to the sale or distribution of tobacco products. Then there was an amendment to the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act signed by President Biden in 20. Uh, 19, which raised the federal minimum age for the sale of tobacco products from 18 to 21, which is what this proposal seeks to do in the city of Tempe. The state of Arizona, here's the, uh, the landscape, if you will, uh, statewide. Arizona is one of only 10 states that do not have a statewide tobacco licensing registry. Uh, the benefits of a registry include um, uh, retailers that sell tobacco products must comply with all tobacco laws or risk losing their license to sell tobacco. It helps to decrease act access to tobacco's products, which in turn leads to a, a decrease in youth prevalence, controls the location and density of tobacco retailers, allows for the imposition of additional restrictions on the sale of tobacco products, such as flavored tobacco, cigarillos, and uh, other vape products. 
And our source for the registry is the Arizona Department of Health Services. Other municipalities who have passed a license structure include Tucson and Flagstaff. They have raised their minimum sales age to 21, uh, to, to raise their minimum sales age to 21, as well as imposing civil penalties, including license revocation for violating the pro prohibition against selling tobacco products to minors. They define tobacco product as any product made or derived from tobacco that contains nicotine, including cigarettes, cigars, chewing tobacco, and liquid nicotine solution. Any component, accessory, or paraphernalia that, you, that is used in the consumption of a tobacco product, including vapes, is also included in this definition. Uh, in addition to Tucson and Flagstaff, Goodyear, Douglas, and Cottonwood have also pro, uh, passed ordinances prohibiting the sale of tobacco, tobacco products or smoking devices to persons under age 21. Now looking at the enforcement landscape here in Tempe, Tempe's draft ordinance currently is, uh, calls for the establishment of a tobacco sales license to be administered by the Tax and License Division. The administration and enforcement is the primary responsi uh, responsibility of the licensing officer and that the police chief or designee shall render assistance in enforcement if necessary. Just to note that the, the fees and penalties under this section are all uh, including violations of restrictions. These are draft restrictions of the sale of flavored tobacco products. Enforcement as uh, adopted in Flagstaff and Tucson, first with Flagstaff, Flagstaff uh, requires retailers subject to two un unannounced compliance checks per year, engaging per, uh, persons between the ages of 18 and 20 to enter establishment to attempt to purchase tobacco products, uh, uh, similar to the AG's pro program statewide. Unannounced compliance checks of all non-compliant retailers required within three months of any violation. Tucson has no specific provisions for enforcement in their adopted ordinance. Exceptions in Tempe, Tempe's draft ordinance does not apply to persons younger than 21 years of age who purchase, use, possess, or attempt to purchase tobacco products. It exempts provision of tobacco products for use as part of indigenous and other practices. Flagstaff in Tucson, Flagstaff does not, uh, Flagstaff, Flagstaff's ordinance rather, does not apply to persons younger than 21 years to age, similar to Tempe. Uh, no specific exemption for indigenous, religious, or cultural practices. Tucson has no specific provisions for exceptions. Now, I think for the benefit of the council members and those in the public, we have a comparison of license fees and fines um, uh, between the three cities. Um, so Tempe's this is Tempe's proposed ordinance, which again includes uh, restrictions on the sale of flavored tobacco products currently. Um, we have a license fee of $300, which is similar to that of Tucson or exactly that of Tucson. Uh, Flagstaff um, words there's a, a bit differently. Um, their fee schedule has wording that it should not, the, the license fee should not exceed the cost of the regulatory program. The first strike fee, I'm saying first strike, this is within a period of 36 months for all of these uh, uh, ordinances. Um, for Tempe, that's $300. Tucson and Flagstaff, it is 500. Second strike, fee and the associated penalty. Um, Tempe, like um, Tucson and Flagstaff's adopted ordinances, um, includes a license suspension of seven days. Um, Tempe's fine is $300, while Tucson and Flagstaff's is 750. As you can see here for the third strike fee and penalty, Tempe's fee remains 300. Um, and Tucson and Flagstaff is set at 1,000. Same for the four strike fee and penalty. Uh, there is no um, additional fine for Tempe currently in the proposed ordinance. However, in Tucson and Flagstaff, 1,000 is, um, is uh, levied against businesses for the four strike. And that uh, includes a, a license revocation. Um, there's no period of time um, specified in Tempe's proposed ordinance, but Flagstaff, does specify that that um, revocation will last for a period of three years. Possible paths forward for the committee and the council. 
A redraft ordinance to focus on establishment of a tobacco sales license, raising the legal age to 21, and all associated fees and penalties. Some policy considerations for uh, the council members to consider. Uh, enforcement, whether to adopt a proactive, um, as the case in one city that we've looked at, which is Flagstaff, or keep a complaint-driven approach similar to the one that has been proposed in Tempe. Define the role of Tempe PD in administration and enforcement, and to explore par possible partnerships with state agencies, uh, including the Attorney General's office. Uh, fines. Um, one policy con consideration to be made here is to bring Tempe's proposed fees into alignment with other cities. And uh, to consider future restrictions on flavored tobacco products. That's something that the council members can discuss with staff about adopting a uh, vapes only approach to restrictions or having a comprehensive flavors approach. Next steps, consensus from the HSCS council committee um, could include um, moving forward with the tobacco sales license focused approach, including raising the legal age for 21 um, and to impose fees and penalties to ensure compliance. Changing the fee penalty structure to align with that adopted by other cities and continuing a dial dialogue with Tempe PD and the tax and license division regarding administration and enforcement, including possible partnerships with other state agencies and keeping exception exemptions for indigenous religious and cultural practices. Now, uh, next steps continued, that would be the public engagement process, I'm calling it 2.0, to acknowledge that we had one um, in the summer and fall of last year. Um, this will include two public uh, forums, one virtual and one in person. I've been told that the in-person uh, meeting will be held at Tempe Public Library, and the date for those meetings will be Monday, March 20th. And an online poll on Tempe Forum to consider uh, changes to this ordinance. And to bring the draft possibly to uh, 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 for discussion by the mayor and council at a future work study session, possibly in April or May. Pending council consensus would post fees to website for a period of 60 days as required by state law. And putting ordinance on regular council meeting agenda for first and second hearing, then of votes. And um, as is currently proposed in the ordinance, uh, delayed implementation dates. So just uh, holding for any questions from the council members. Paul, thank you, appreciate the update and thank you for your work on this. I know this has been uh, a very long process for everybody going through this and I appreciate you leading the way on this for sure. Um, couple questions, uh, and I don't know if you know the answer, but uh, with Tucson, why why no enforcement or do, the, do we have any speculation? I think that's, a, uh, thank you, Council, Council Member, for that question. I think that's a subject of future research that could be done by staff. Um, but uh, one possible uh, reason for that would be to leave that at the discretion of the police officers or the police department. So we would have to do more research into that approach, which include reaching out to them um, and to, to, to kind of uh, get their approach as part of our own ongoing dialogue with Tempe PD and with tax and license. They are currently um, uh, partnering in the enforcement and administration of this ordinance, but that could be changed at your direction at a future meeting. Right, and thank you on that. And, and like us, I, I think one of the challenges we have you know, as a council is having PD being the front person for enforcement and various things, and we want to take things off, at least I do, take things off their place and plates. And I know that enforcement um, hopefully can be done in other ways and, and we can get creative on that. At, at the best case, it'd be great that the state would be the ones doing this stuff and not the cities. Um, so I know we can try to work on that too. Um, when we talk about Tucson and, and being in line with their, um, why, why are price points in terms of fines? I guess I'll start that way. Yes, um, well, in our research um, that, became very clear that there was a divergence there in our fee structure. So this is an opportunity to take this um, additional time that's been granted um, for consideration of this ordinance to bring those more into alliance. And if they diverged for a specific reason, to research that reason and to get feedback on that. We do have a public engagement process that will be beginning 
um, to consider all of these different questions. So I think that we would expect to have um, feedback from our business community and industry representatives on that fee structure, how it's been working in other cities, and then take that opportunity to see what's working. Um, the goal of the fees is not to be punitive, but to ensure compliance with the licensing system. So I think with that spirit, we can look into that and do some more research on behalf of the council. No, and that's perfect. At the end of the day, that's what we want to do. And I think, you know, as a shop owner, I think being compliant, you know, playing everybody playing under the same rules, so to speak, no problem. Um, but I love the fact we're going out to community, we're going out to shop owners, we're getting some input with some feedback. I think that's um, huge. I think it's great that that we're starting this this conversation again. Um, as I know, this is a, a very big talk, topic. Um, you know, I, the the compliance piece. You know, you talked about. <clears throat> you know, there's a there's a complaint driven and proactive one. You know, obviously, I, you know, I think both are great, uh, but with the proactive has some costs with it. Uh, and unless we can figure out those things and how we can deal with that, you know, that would be my preference. But if it's complaint driven, it's complaint driven, uh, so to speak, for the start. And I know that we'll have, probably have some more input on that. And then. Um, I think the online poll, uh, if we have a chance to look at those questions before, before they go out, that'd be great, uh, at least for this committee, um, just to kind of have a second set of eyes and just kind of go through that. So I appreciate the work. I think this is great and look forward to the discussions in the future from the uh, public. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, okay so um, I'm, agreement, I'm in agreement with what we have been presenting and I just want to make sure that we have um, verbal consensus on moving forward. So I'm going to read the items that, um, that was on the slide. So um, moving forward with the tobacco sales license focused approach, including raising the legal age to 21 for tobacco sales and imposing fees penalties to ensure compliance. Okay. Good. okay. Changing fee penalty structure to align um, with that adopted by other cities. Agree. Okay. Continuing dialogue with Tempe PD and tax license division regarding administration enforcement, including possible partnerships with other state agencies. Definitely. Agreed. Yep. And keeping exemptions um, for indigenous religious and cultural practices. Agreed. All right, you have consensus on all four matters. Thank you, council members. It's been Thank a you. pleasure to uh, serve the committee. And I just have to say that my council member, Paul, is unfortunately leaving me. Um, next Friday is his last day, and I just want to say that I think he's absolutely incredible. Smartest guy I know, and uh, thank you for all your work, Paul. All right. Oh. You have the little blue one. B. All right, uh, agenda items for the future meeting, for the future meetings for HSCS committee will be announced at a later date. And <laughs> we don't have, we uh, have not posted our next date yet, so we will post it on our website. So if you have any other questions and want to know more about our committee, what we're doing and what we're going to be doing moving forward in our dates, look on uh, tempe.gov forward slash HSCS, and that information will be on our website. Um, again, we just want to just thank you, um, thank everybody for showing up to our meeting. And again, we appreciate your voices on all of the matters that are important in our community. So thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you.